We've done some pilots where literally like filling out these forms is better than most rides at Disneyland. Like they, they love it. And it's so weird to me that, <laughs> that filling out these forms is actually so satisfying, but it tells you how much pain. Everyone really understands their pain here. I've always said like, listen, we want to make this process, which people have loved to hate. And we want to turn it into a process that people yep. love. CEO and co-founder. Go on down to the Elliot Hodges is the CEO of Anduin. He's a superstar at Pound here at the technology company Blend as well. He's an avid mountain climber and adventurer, and he's doing amazing work right now focusing on the private markets, the private markets of capital tend to outperform the public markets they have over the last couple of decades, but it's a mess to transact in them. You want to subscribe to even to a top fund, hundreds of pages of legal work. There's no reason it shouldn't be a lot more like signing up to a buy a public stock, but you're gonna need some great technology to do that. That's where Elliot's taking us. He's working with hundreds of funds, has amazing momentum. Let's find out about the future of the private markets with Elliot Hodges. Elliot, we're excited to have you here with us today. Great to be here, Joe. Thank you. Elliot Hodges, the CEO of Anduin, and we'll talk about that. Uh, in your past, you were at Blend, you were at Palantir, you were in Afghanistan. I do want to talk about the climbing mountains, though. What is this climbing mountains? Did, we, did this be started when you were in Afghanistan or what? Uh, so my background, I grew up in a German-American household. Uh, so I grew up in Washington, D.C. Uh, my father is from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. My mother is German. Uh, and uh, part of being German is uh, making sure that I spoke German as a kid and got sent to a German boarding school for several years and uh, had the benefit of having a, um, a, a, a PE teacher who would take us down to uh, Italy, um, into the Dolomites, and we'd do a lot of climbing then in the mid-90s. I mean, it was kind of crazy. Like, this guy, um, that teacher would, like, take us up Mont Blanc. I was, like, in 10th grade, we would go up Mont Blanc, routes that I'd later learned um, that were just like pretty dangerous. And, um, but at the time, you know, it was very uh, considered very adventurous and, um, you know, stopped for a while during college, but then sort of picked it up again, uh, moving back here in California. So, you know, climbing here in Yosemite and doing some international uh, climbing in, you know, volcanoes in Mexico. I skied off a 20,000 foot mountain in Peru. You skied off a 20,000 foot mountain. Uh, Pisco. How, how'd you get to the top of that? You get dropped off or? We got, I mean, you know, you take a, take a plane to a nearby town and then you're at 15,000 feet and then you take a truck up to 16 and then you hike up to 17, 17 and go from there. And, um, uh, it's, uh, I mean, it's pretty incredible. It's also really scary. And, um, so we've done that. I've obviously, now that I'm settled down, my, you know, my wife has kind of, uh, curtailed a lot of that. I won't go into details about trying to get life insurance, uh, when you self-identify as a climber, it's a, oh, it's a challenge. Funny. That's funny. We'll have to go on a secret climbing trip yeah. for, for business purposes. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we uh, we do hella skiing, which is also somewhat risky, but not as risky as that, I think. It's a different, sure. it's a lower yeah. level. So you were at Palantir. Or, what years were you at Palantir? I was at Palantir. So I came out to the Valley. I was one of those people who uh, uh, had the misfortune of graduating into the 02 recession uh, from undergrad and then in the 09 recession from business school from Kellogg. Uh, so moved out to the Valley, as you know, it was like a much quieter place back in 2009. And I remember having a conversation with someone, just asking somebody like, what are the most exciting companies out here? And uh, somebody said, well, there's this company called Facebook, which we all knew, right? Which at the time had 100 million users. It sounded uh, fantastically large, uh, but the cat was out of the bag on that one. And then they'd mentioned this cool company that had 50 people at the time called Palantir. And what resonated with me then was just that it sort of married the two worlds that, the one world that I knew pretty well, which was Washington DC having grown up there, but it also married this world that I very so much wanted to be a part of, which was this sort of world of technology. So um, I knocked on Palantir's door several times before they actually let me in. Uh, there's a strong anti-MBA bias at that company, so um, <laughs> which, uh, uh, but- um, There's only rare exceptions allowed. That's only true. rare exceptions. So I think I got into my second or third try uh, and I kind of, uh, but it, it was a fantastic ride. And you know, where I focused my efforts on was sort of one sort of early business development into um, the uh, some federal agencies, non 
uh, non-security related, uh, but then also trying to get these big data companies, the Lexus Nexuses of the world, to play nice, I think, with the Palantir ecosystem in order to sort of enrich a lot of these investigatory and uh, uh, sort of data outcomes that Palantir was driving towards. So. And then you were at Blend for a little bit as well. And then I was at Blend. I joined a group of extremely talented sort of early Palantir employees at this other company called Blend and uh, got to be part of that sort of, God, it's like first 20 who were looking to bring mortgages to to the you know mortgage applications to the phone and at the time it was kind of considered outrageous we had to convince people that hey people don't want to walk into a retail branch and fill out a five page mortgage application form and that's kind of when I it's joined very, and, very backwards industry you guys brought to the cloud you have I, mean, I think it's probably I think there's over two hundred million dollars revenue in banks now so that it, it worked on the need has to kind of pull out of the current market situation but I'm still bullish on it yeah absolutely yeah. I think it's it's yeah. super exciting it's really impressive what they've done there and. Uh, again, uh, a lot more innovation, I think, that the uh, uh, that the credit unions and, and banks can uh, uh, can take here. And you've played fintech, crypto type stuff. And then what brought you to Anduin? What is Anduin? Well, Anduin is a, and by the way, the name Anduin uh, comes, I have, I have a weakness for uh, for companies named after the Lord of the Rings. So uh, Anduin uh, is the land of the rivers from the Lord of the Rings. And uh, it is a uh, startup uh, that was really rooted in a lot of the pain that people feel when transacting in the private markets, aka any company that isn't public. Um, and if you're an individual investor, it is extremely painful. It's a very exciting world because you're accessing the returns and the diversification that these hedge funds and uh, private equity shops provide. And that's very exciting, but it's a highly analog process. And there's a lot of pain involved at every single point in the process. It sounds a little bit like blend with you five filling up five pages for but a mortgage. My entire career has been about uh, this sort of tech arbitrage into these sort of highly analog uh, spaces. So if someone wants to buy a stock, they go on their Schwab or their Robinhood app and you click a button and you're done. Or in my case, I call my family office because I'm too lazy to yeah. use the thing myself. But but for normal people, it's now to click. But if you want to actually buy, like in, buy into a fund, or you want to buy a private stock, there's a lot more complicated process. You have to fill out. Oftentimes, it's called an LPA. It is a 50 to 100 page static form uh, that is very dense uh, and is filled out incorrectly 90% of the time. So the industry has a term called NIGO or NIGO which is, means not in good order, which means any one of these documents have one or more errors, and it leads to horrible investor experiences. It leads to costly delays. Um, and I can't tell you how many emails I get from friends. You know, they send me emails <laughs> emails with subject headers, you know, FML, and it's sort of a 20-threaded email that they have. They want to make an investment. They're, you know, they're talking to some head of a jam German family office, and they're just trying to align on the right you know, form or, or the Germans probably wouldn't out. even let you do it until it's all right too, because they're picky. Well, they're they're yeah. exactly picky. So so what what we effectively do is consumerize the we help the funds right the GP um, onboard their investors very quickly and efficiently into their investment vehicles. And what we do is we take these static LPAs and we consumerize them right to make them really dynamic and really easy for people to fill out. So the, the best analogy, again, is just the, the TurboTax analogy where we now um, just build logic around all of these fields so that the investor is never presented with extraneous information. And once they filled out one, I'd imagine it's much faster to fill out the next one if you have all the AI around that. that all the AI, all, all the data. Um, and I think that's the whole point here is where you can sort of build up a, a, a sort of a common data picture, I think, of, of these investor profiles. And no investor wants to fill up the same information. I mean, that's like literally the biggest pain point is like, if I invest in fund A, I have to go through this, uh, this process. And then you have slightly different docs asking for the same information in fund B, and you have to go through the same thing again. And so- And how big is this ecosystem? This is like a few thousand investors doing this? Is it like, how many investors are on there in the world do, solving these types of problems for? Well, I mean, there are you know tens, low tens of thousands of GPs globally, right? Across hedge venture, uh, U.S. is the largest market. You've got um, you've got private equity. Uh, you've got um, Europe. After that, I mean, I, I, the, you know, right now we've we've had twenty two thousand investors go through Anduin. We have about four percent of the global private market, so forty billion dollars processed through Anduin. So you think maybe that means there's probably like several hundred thousand of these? Yeah, investors. I think. But I think I think more critically, like. I think there's this huge democratization and retailization trend that's occurring in the private markets where 
you know, we're building Anduin, I think not just for the current GPs and the current LPs, it's a really about that the next wave uh, of investors that want, to, want access to the space. The investors want access to the private markets, they want the diversification, they want those returns, but critically, you look at these GPs, they all want access to these smaller investors. So you want to be in smaller investors, but it's really high cost right now. To, it's high cost. To the bureaucracy and the legal forums and stuff. A absolutely. I mean, for these funds have never truly had to operate. You know, they, they have these back offices that are largely dealing with largely manual processes. They're slammed, mm -hmm. and they've never really had to operate at sort of enormous amount of scale and interfacing with these smaller check sizes. But I think every single back office and middle office that we talk to, like the holy grail for them is like to, tr they want to diversify their LP base, right? Um, and they're, everyone's just trying to figure out how can we operate on board, but also successfully interface with these investors at scale while providing an awesome investor experience. I think that's like the broader story here is how do we, how do we go from providing one unhappy path to all of our investors to providing these uh, configured happy paths for each individual investor, because I think the, the end outcome, people really want loyal investors that invest and reinvest and well, grow. They don't want to think about any of these issues. Let's step back a little bit. So private markets, they've outperformed, you know, private markets means everything that's not like a normal public stock and a public bond, right? So there's venture funds, hedge funds, private equity, but in essence, these are funds that are, that are taking money and that are going and, and, and doing things in private companies, whether they're loading to them or investing in yep. them. And these private markets have outperformed on average over the last few decades, even, right? I think it's been in the last couple of decades is like 14% on average, depending how you measure it, uh, versus maybe 9% or something for public markets. Is that, first of all, is that going to continue? Is there too much money in private markets? Is it something that, are you bullish on this ecosystem as a whole? I'm, I mean, I'm enormously bullish. I mean, this is an ecosystem that's going to grow from, you know, it's slated, it's a $15 trillion asset industry today. It's going to be a $25 trillion asset industry in the next couple of years. Um, and I don't think this is going away. And I think with improved technology, it'll be easier for people to invest and deploy this capital, which means, you know, we're lowering the barriers to entry for new emerging fund managers, but also making it easier and more affordable for these larger GPs to interface with these investor bases. So, so people might have new ideas about here's things that need money that could that could be viable to our world, and right now they're not getting money, and so so, so basically allows people to start and create things in the world. A absolutely, and I think that's that's a super exciting a future that I think everyone can sort of look forward to. This is called the alternative investing world. It's called alts. Private markets are called the alts yeah. as well. Like, is, is, is alts particularly exciting right now? Like, what are ways in which it's changing? I Again, I think it's it's the democratization piece, which is big. Um, I mean, listen, I sort of think about as this space starts to retail retailize and democratize, you know, there's probably going to be, you know, there's been sort of indications of more scrutiny from Washington. But I think the opportunity here is if we create a industry that's, digitized, I think it can be responsive to any changes in the environment in a way that doesn't sort of negatively impact, you know, cause undue friction, right? And so mm -hmm. to strike a happy medium, and I think uh, that's the world that we're trying to, to build towards. And so 2021, very good year in VC. Uh, you know, 2020 was good, 21 was even better. They raised tons of money in the new venture capital funds. I think it was a few hundred billion, it's a record. 2022, wasn't quite as strong, obviously. It started off strong and things were really down. Yeah. Like what do you what are you seeing at the end of 2022, start of 2023? Like are they got subscriptions up? Are there, are there more funds raising? Well, Is listen, it slower? like everyone, I mean, we're not seeing, I mean, it was like one of the things that I was like keeping a close sort of, you know, when the market started to turn last year, it was like one of the things that I was sort of wondering about was like, what does this what does this mean for demand? And like demand for our product has has if only it's only increased because of the denominator effect, because quite frankly, like because this is now becoming a standard, right? Because people have been doing this process with paper and email for a very long time. And this is kind of an investor-led standard that investors are demanding. And it used to just be that onboarding an investor was just something you did. And if I was going to invest in a Sequoia fund, well, guess what? I would walk over some very hot coals to get my money into that fund. But it turns out like in this new environment, like your on your onboarding process is your product. So, um, uh, so, I mean, that's certainly a trend. Demand hasn't slackened one bit. And I think if anything, yeah, this is very much the standard. And the one data point that I just sort of point out there is the fact that law firms, and I can say this because my father is a lawyer, like the fact that lawyers are now adopting this technology, either trying it's to- It's pretty build, shocking, it's right? Pretty, it's, it's, it's massively shocking, but it, it, it tells you that they're, in, in many cases, they're, they're leading, they're partnering, they're leading, 
and they're trying to bring this technology because their clients are demanding it and the clients are demanding it because their investors are demanding it. And um, so that's because uh, the lawyers are probably in some cases make more money if they just took longer with old fashioned ways. But 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 this is almost like a high integrity thing for them to do. And also just makes them look stupid if they're not doing it. In some yeah, ways. I think they're sort of viewed as I, you know, I think that the smart ones get that their lever is providing awesome legal advice and it's not charging hundreds of dollars an hour, ensuring sort of accurate form fill. Um, yeah. And so, and again, there's a very interesting, it's been good for us, but there's very much a um, an arms race uh, going on amongst the law firms. Everyone's trying to weaponize and get ready for this new world. So yep. it's at a point now where they're, it's just about parity and, uh, and a defensive measure to have technology. Makes like sense, this. makes sense. And even if the market's slowing down, there's so many more customers coming on, the, the Anduin's growing fast. Uh, so you, so you, you took over Anduin after it had already been started and it, it was, it had a really strong, in my impression, engineering and product team, and they had a really good product. It was close to being good, but but you you really started to like focus it and grow the revenue. To tell me a little bit about that process. Yeah, I mean, listen, like when I joined, I think the the story was here's this very exciting company with sort of deep product and engineering DNA that had built out sort of a series of private market products for various different stakeholders. Um, it was. Uh, you know, at the, when I joined Anduin at the time, we were kind of this uneven athlete, right? Where we had a strong upper torso and just very spindly legs, right? So we had one salesperson when I joined. Yep. And, you know, part <laughs> of our goal here was to, you know, it was leg day every day for a while and, and the hiring, <laughs> building of a BDR team and, and, and marketing. And I think for a long time, Anduin was just this like very well-kept secret. Um, and I think increasingly, it's just cool to see the, traction and I think uh, people it's, talking about it. It's interesting to me because you can have a really good product, but unless you have a really good sales team to get it out there, obviously it doesn't really work. And then obviously I think you focus the product more to iterate it on it. But it's all, it, I've noticed how it is growing virally now because it, it's become a standard, but you kind of had to get it out to enough people to get that viral growth to start. Or like, t Tell me a little bit how that works. I mean, it's just about... It's listening to the LP. We get, you know, we, we listen to that feedback very closely. We sort of see where... You know, we track NPS very, very closely. And again, I've always said like, listen, we want to make this process, which people have loved to hate, and we want to turn it into a process that people yep. love. And um, I mean, we're now, I think we're like just shy of what an Apple type experience is. We've done some pilots where literally like filling out these forms is better than most rides at Disneyland. Like they they love it. And it's so weird to me that <laughs> that filling out these forms is actually so satisfying, but it tells you how much pain this is the first job I've ever had. You know, at Pound here early days, we really had to educate people on their pain yeah. before we could sell them technology. The, every, the everyone really understands their pain here. Huh? And uh, um, I, you know, there was this, there were about two weeks of sort of buyer's remorse between signing my contract with Anduin and starting. I was just like, well, I'm a first time CEO. I'm managing a uh, workforce remotely that's partially located in Vietnam of all places. Like this is like, unlike any other company, um, by the way, like prior to Anduin, never even really heard about the private market. So that was entirely new to me. But the thing that was so interesting, like on my first day, my very first phone call that I had, per, we explained what we did. We explained, you know, this LP, the pain around LP onboarding. And somebody said, you don't need to explain this to me. This is the biggest pain in the butt of my life. Like, I'm so glad that you exist. And that was just sort of eye opening to me like that. So glad that you exist. I've never heard that before. And so it's not felt like slinging software. Yeah. It's more felt like people want us to solve these the, problems. The terrorists weren't so glad we existed at Palantir. They, so. they weren't, they weren't, yeah. <laughs> a different different type of problem. <laughs> you mentioned like the team's, a lot of remote. A lot of this team is based in Vietnam. We've hired extraordinary people in Vietnam, really strong culture there. What's it like running that global team? Do you do you visit Vietnam a lot? What's, how's the culture like there? You'll be shocked. I have yet, because of COVID in the United States and then COVID in Vietnam where they had a hard lockdown yeah. uh, to the point where people couldn't even leave their, their buildings. Uh, I have yet to visit Vietnam, so I'm actually going out in two weeks and so couldn't oh, wow. be more excited. Very cool. I mean, listen, it's like, I mean, it's incredible. I think what's what's I love about this company is a global US Vietnamese organization that's bringing, like evolving the standard for private markets globally. Like that's, I think that's super exciting. And the fact that we have a company that's always working uh, and advancing the ball for our clients, I think is super That's exciting. That's kind of cool too. Like when you're sleeping, people are out there are working. People are, people yeah. are working. And it's, it's 12 hours almost exactly, right? It's like Texas, I think it's 12 hours yeah. from Vietnam. And so, so the only challenge is like it makes hours. for, you know, my mornings, I sort of get get slung out of a, 
get fired out of a cannon at six o'clock and take calls <laughs> with Vietnam. And then my afternoons are relatively quiet, but then I have calls with, uh, with, uh, with Vietnam in the evening, but it's, we've made it work. And do you nap in the afternoon sometimes? I'll now? sometimes take a nap and, uh, and, uh, you know, work out or do something. And, um, so I've, I've learned to cherish my afternoons and, uh, and I've tried to sort of set some barriers around sort of evening calls yeah. to make sure they don't, they don't, uh, go too you long. Shouldn't be up in the middle of the night every night. Uh, that's, that's, out. that's the thing. So, uh, luckily, I have a kid, so I'm. I'm uh, that happens in any event. So yeah, I've noticed there's obviously very hard working culture in Vietnam. I'm amazed that obviously you get some really top engineers there that don't cost as much. I mean, people live very, very well in Vietnam on fifty thousand dollars. Is yeah. my impression. It, 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 what, what do you think of the talent you've seen? So oh, far the there? talent is. I mean, that was sort of the. We've got in. I mean, on par with you know the best engineers that I worked with at Palantir and at Blend. And what's cool about Anduin was they were a pioneer, like who would have thought that there'd be this vibrant startup culture in, uh, in Vietnam. And Anduin was certainly one of the first companies to, to be there. Obviously we, we no longer have sort of the right of first refusal on the best talent in Vietnam, i.e. there's just other companies out there. Fangs are now recruiting in Vietnam. So I think this, the word is out that there are great people there, but what I've loved at this company is like people come to Anduin because of the culture and critically they stay because of the culture. And more importantly, and I've never had this happen at any other company where People leave the company, they'll be gone for one or two years and they'll actually come back to Anduin, right? So they oh, go to a different company or they, they, they do get a uh, advanced PhD degree, but they come back because they love the company, they love their peers and, and they just learn tons. And I'm excited because I think we, like, we've got amazing engineers, but I don't think we've scratched the surface yet of like what they're truly capable of. And I'm just excited for all the innovation that's going to come in the private market. So a lot, so a lot you can build. And a lot you, can, a lot you can build more cheaply than your competitors too with that kind of talent. Absolutely. What, I mean, what are some of the most important principles and frameworks for building a SaaS company? Like as a builder, as a CEO, you, you think through these things. Like what frameworks are you excited about or are you learning about? God, I mean, listen, like I think for us, it's just like how do we gain access to these funds and quite frankly, like establish feedback. I mean, it's really about establishing feedback loops, right? And um and so whether it's our sales team or our CS team or the account management team. CS like, stands for customer support. Customer success or customer success. support. Okay. Like they're collecting, they're interfacing with customers every single day. And so to make sure that we're collecting the feedback, it's largely positive or negative, but like it's sometimes negative, but collecting that and making sure that that gets relayed back to the product team to make sure that we have just really high signal to noise ratio and that we're building the right stuff for our customers. Um, so that's something that we just like, I mean, it's, it's mostly about process to get that right, but that's something that we really focus it sounds on. Sounds like you're really focused on customers and customers success and just like what they need to win the market. Oh, absolutely. And it could, cause I think for us, it's also like, we're now at this point where God, we have hundreds of customers and really trying to avoid the squeaky wheel Right. We, yeah. There's always, there's always one off requests yeah. that are loud, but then, yeah, that, that's always a challenge for me. Cause for me, it's somewhat intuitive, like what's needed to fix the high level problem. But now you have like 300 different feature requests. And how do you optimize 300 feature requests? There has to be someone focused on that full yeah. time and I mean, prioritizing I think, it. Yeah. I, well, I think that's, I, we're sort of getting to that point. We're getting a lot of feedback, but it's just, you know, I think at the end of the day, it's about having like very clear personas and understanding like what's a journey right? That is exciting uh, to this customer. And then obviously giving plenty of room for validation. Let, let, let's, let's jump into that a little bit. A, yeah. pers a persona is like the type of customer. So one persona is the lawyer. Another persona is the LP or the investor themselves. One persona is the different types of people to fund. Exactly. And then you, and then you develop these things they are called roadmaps, right? Where you say, okay, over the next quarters, we're this is what we, we plan on building out. And this is what we know with hundred percent certainty because there's, there's debt that we have to clean up and, or there's some urgent thing that we need to build in order to land this really big customer. And then obviously as you go down quarter wise, there's obviously sort of less certainty around what you build, but you have some signal. And so I think it's just this iterative process of where you're, you're, allowing your customers, you have a clear sense of who you're building for, you're creating these exciting journeys or what you believe to be exciting or what you're seeing, and then you're just getting validation, I think, from, from the team, but also critically uh, from the law firm or the fund admin uh, and, the, and the fund that you're, you're building. So anyone you've tried to cultivate an open culture, you said, where all ideas will be heard, what, what does that actually mean in practice? I, listen, I mean, you know, you know, been working in the Valley now for over a decade and, you know, I, when you're not the CEO, you have the perception of the CEO as, uh, you know, you hear all these like 
stories of of you know uh, Steve Jobs you know demanding the iPhone and 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 so the words that the, the stories that kind of get that become legendary the ones where the CEO takes often a um, you know sort of a command uh, style approach and you know I've sort of just have found that that style like certainly with our team in Vietnam it's just sort of not. Um, I think what what resonates and actually moves the needle. So certainly it's something I'll I'll do when I have to around topics that I'm certainly passionate about. And uh, but I think fundamentally, I think um, you know it's about it's a culture of of, of consultation and influence. Um, and I mean the good news is like at the end of the day we we have a whether it's in, here in the U.S. or in Vietnam, I think we're fully aligned on 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 our mission. We're, we all love this company, and um, and so that obviously helps. And and so yeah, it's just about consulting properly and uh, and and making sure we we arrive at the right outcome. And Elliot, I want to ask you: We started American Optimist to kind of push back on the cynicism and pessimism we're seeing right now, and a lot of people, especially a lot of young people, are very negative on the future of the world. You've obviously lived through some pretty cynical things what happened in Afghanistan after your work there. Uh, you, you know, right now you're working on with this very inspiring company, but you're working with people in Vietnam, who are also a very poor country, a lot of a lot of suffering there. Like, what what gives you hope for the future? How do you see things are going to be more positive? I mean, listen, like I think the bigger picture here is. God, over 50 years ago, the United States was caught in a bloody civil war in Vietnam. Uh, 50 years later, we now have a company that is successfully collaborating within Vietnam. We have amazing engineers from 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 Hanoi collaborating with people uh, in Saigon uh, who are in turn collaborating with uh, engineers and salespeople and marketers in the United States to bring technology to fund admins and law firms and 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 GPs who are in turn serving sort of ever broadening audience of of investors and future investors who are in turn investing in new strategies new funds and new uh, new ideas and that's something that's sort of hard not to be optimistic about about that sort of bigger picture and that's that's one that I'm excited to be a part of that's awesome you're taking the all, people all around the world are working together and they're solving problems and they're putting money towards good things that are, are going to make the future better absolutely I love it thanks Elliot thank you 